Rachel Korozin, and if you find it, find it totally unpronounceable, I'll respond to Rachel. I almost wonder how important it is to tell you that I'm Dr. Rachel Korozin. And here is my answer to that. Rachel is the name I was given by my parents at birth. Korozin I got from under the chuppah. <laughs> and the doctor part is the only part I did myself. So what the heck, Dr. Rachel Korozin. Okay. Okay. My PhD is a research work of the Jewish a Jewish day school in Budapest, Hungary. Yes, I do speak Hungarian. Nice. I could hear your accent. And yes, I do speak Hungarian. And it's a research of the Jewish day school that was started in Budapest right after the fall of the communist regime. I've worked for many, many a year in a non-profit organization, one of the largest one in the, Jew in the Jewish world, called the Jewish Agency for Israel. It will be known to Israelis as Hasochnut HaYehudit, okay? Uh, if you ever get to go to Federation, wherever you happen to live, that means that I have been on your payroll for 25 years. <laughs> this is no solicitation, just thank you. Uh, about two years ago, I, in these few minutes that we have together, is try to offer you a set of spectacles, additional to the ones we are already wearing, mm -hmm. that will help you look at Yad Vashem as an Israeli place of commemorating the Holocaust. Now, people say, hang on for a minute, Rachel or Rachel, because I cannot pronounce Rachel. What do you mean Israeli place of commemorating the Holocaust? The Holocaust was one. So what can be so special about Israeli? Well, it seems there is. True, the Holocaust was one, but ways of relating to it would be very, very different. I'll give you an example. If you ever went to your U.S., central place of commemorating the Holocaust, not the only, but the central, Washington, D.C., okay? Mm -hmm. Anybody? Yes. One there? Good show, Frank. Thank you. You took the elevator, like I did, right? Everybody takes the elevator. Yeah. It pulls you up to the fourth floor. While you're there, you hear a voice talking to you. It's Dwight Eisenhower, one of your former presidents, not mine, yours. He was the chief commander of the Allies' forces when liberated, liberating Europe. And he is heard there from a speech of what, and I quote him, our eyes have seen when we opened the gates of those places, the Nazi concentration camps. So you understand that the Holocaust Museum of the US in Washington, D.C., the story will be told from the perspective of what our eyes have seen, namely the American eyes. Is that your perspective, ma'am? Way of understanding it, ways of making meaning of it, are very, very different. And Yad Vashem is an Israeli museum. And therefore the narrative it presents to you is an Israeli one, and now I will add another layer. Not only is it an Israeli one, but it is a dynamic Israeli one. Because the Israeli narrative had changed with time. The narrative, not the Holocaust, the Holocaust did not change. But the way we understand it is in this country had changed with us, with our society changing. And this is the story I'd like to trace for you a little bit. For fully tracing it, we will need a semester. We don't have it. We have 45 minutes. This is what we will do. Okay? In order to do that, I'd like to take you back to the year 1946. Oftentimes, I speak to groups to whom 1946 sounds like ancient history. I know that when speaking to American citizens, one is not to make age remarks, but blind I am not. And therefore, I think that for some of the people sitting in this room, 1946 is not ancient history. Okay? For a very particular reason. If I went back to 45, 44, 43, 42, etc., to start my story, which I could have, I will have to go into this whole mess of who knew what when. Did the State Department know about Auschwitz? Could they have bombed? I don't want to go there. <coughs> not that it's not important. 
but not from my story. I want to go to the year 1946 because at that point, a good year after liberation, nobody in their mi right mind can claim that they do not know. By that time, the survivors are talking already. By that time, the GIs are home already, <coughs> and they are talking, so you know. America is getting ready for the Nuremberg trials. By 46, not yet, but getting ready. So it's on the new list. You do not yet own televisions, but still, there are ways of transmitting information even prior to television. Our grandchildren do not believe it, but they were. We know it. My, I'm structuring, or I'm using, I would say, three main building blocks for my presentation for you tonight. Fact that I may know from well-referenced sources. Facts that I know from individual sources, mainly my parents, mainly my mother, may she rest in peace. And here and there, a little bit of carefully developed fiction so that it's not really facts that had happened, but they will help you connect the stories. They are probable. They could have happened. Okay? It's 1946. I'm taking you to Germany after World War II. I'm taking you to one of those places called DP camps, displaced persons camps. Okay? Most of these places are on the sites of the former Nazi camps because they had barracks, you know? They had shelter from the rain. Now I'm asking you for something logical. This is you thinking. Germany at that time is divided into four zones. Russian, British, French, and American, according to the Allies. All of them want to help the survivors. But if you are a Jewish survivor in your right mind, what zone are you trying to get to? You're smart people. You're smart people. Let's think why. Russians? Ah. Ah. Okay. The French were not that great to the Jews. Brits, you know, with their involvement in Palestine. Who knows? Americans' food will be better. In the American zone, will the food be better? Yes. Will the doctors be better? Yes. Is there a chance for having Jewish people among the staff? Yes. yes. No? Do you need any more reasons? American zone. There will be Jewish people on the staff. I mean, a mention of the survivors is in the American zone. For solid reasons. Let's imagine we go into one of those DP camps, and I'd like for us to imagine two types of survivors. This is the part when it's not solid fact, but it's all realistic. I'd like to explore with you the story of a survivor who prior to the war had been a modern liberal Jew of a free profession, doctor, accountant, lawyer, whatever, in any European capital, Paris, Vienna, Budapest, Bucharest, Berlin, <laughs> Warsaw. And I like to explore, I, I, I'll need males for this, then I'll have ladies later, okay? And I want the character of a survivor who would be a Hasidic person. You know who those are. Mm -hmm. Anybody among the men here cares to be my liberal Jew? Hmm? Yeah. No volunteers? One liberal Jew, calling once, calling twice. Thank you, sir. Anybody, anybody here cares to be my Satmar Hasid, the Hasidic person?